Jim gave me a really broad topic, so I guess that means I can do whatever I want, but I like to focus right down in the weeds on my latest obsession. So I promise you I'm going to get to my latest obsession, but I did promise Jim that I would try to stay up uh, a little higher, at least for a while. And so I'd like to start with the premise, Jim showed you actually a slide of sort of what is health economics and a, a couple of lists, micro, macro, etc. I'd like to suggest to you that at least the reason we do health economics is because we're interested in getting better value out of the money that we spend on health, right? It's pretty much that simple. We want value for the money that we spend on health. And even though Jim put global into the topic of my talk, now that I'm back in the US, this is like nirvana for a health economist because there's no place in the world that comes even close to the inefficiency we have in this country. We spend more money to get less than anywhere in the world by far. I mean, we just waste enormous amounts of money in our healthcare system here. And that means that, boy, we need a lot of health economists. <laughs> so it's really good that we're breeding them here. Um, the, it's probably not just true in health, because we're not really good at investing money and getting educational value out either. And I was shocked to discover, uh, the other day I was at a nutrition conference, and learn that in this country we throw away 40% of the food that we produce. We probably overconsume another 40%. Um, so the, the degree of inefficiency that we have in some of the systems is, is, is remarkable, but I think nowhere is it as remarkable as, as, as it is in health. I mean, I, I, not too long ago I got new glasses. Um, they cost me more than the laptop I bought my son, right? Um, two days ago, I lost a crown. It's a little tiny thing. It's about half a centimeter on a side white, you know, ceramic something. And I'm sure it's going to cost me a thousand bucks to put it back on, right? And I'm a healthy guy, thank God. Um, we do spend remarkable amounts of money for things which other parts of the world produce far more efficiently. So this is a great place to be a health economist. You'd wonder why when I went into health economics, instead of staying and working on this stuff, I ran away. Um, because I did run away. You know, I, the reason I became interested in all of this in the first place was the fact that, you know, I was in med school in San Diego and we were doing things like one patient was transformative for me, came into the ER, he had bandages from his knees down, he was diabetic, he lived under a bridge, we took off his bandages, we cleaned all the maggots off of his wounds, we admitted him to the ICU, we spent $90,000, quote, tuning him up, unquote, and that was a lot of money back then. And then we discharged him back to his bridge. Right? So in any rational sense of how you would spend money to make this man's life better, admitting him once a month for a tune-up into the ICU and discharging him back to his bridge is not the way to do it. Right? And I spent a summer working at the Congressional Budget Office. And then I decided that if I, were, if I actually worked on global health and applied some of these principles to places where policymakers actually listened to the recommendations, it would be a whole lot easier to have greater impact. And so Jaime convinced me to come to Mexico years after that. And there, Julio Frank was our minister, and we would do research, and we would find things, and they would change what they did in the government. And it would make people healthier. And it was just a wonderfully virtuous cycle. So now, since I'm older and uh, something, I don't know, um, I'm actually excited about taking on some of these challenges here at home because they are massive challenges here at home. So I'm not going to focus that much on the global part. Because what I want to say is, if we think about how we apply the tools of health economics to deal with this question, not just locally, but globally, and how can we get the greatest value out of what we spend on health, then, well, the first thing we have to do is to think about how are we applying our own efforts, right? What should we be doing? to maximize the impact that we, the health econom economists, can have on that. And let me use a medical analogy. Um, thing I learned somewhere in the middle of med school, um, when is a diagnostic test useful? And the answer is, it's most useful when you have no idea whether it's going to be positive or negative. Because if you're pretty much certain that a diagnostic test is going to show the presence of a disease, then you would have treated the disease even if you didn't have the diagnostic test, and it's not going to change much. So the diagnostic test only helps you 
if you're pretty sure the patient had the disease, you would have treated the disease, but the diagnostic test showed you that the patient didn't have the disease, and you got to save inappropriately treating somebody. And similarly, if you're doing a diagnostic test where you're pretty sure the patient doesn't have it, and the test confirms that you don't have it, then you wouldn't have treated them at for it anyway, and you didn't change what you would have done. It, it's the greatest value when you have the greatest uncertainty. So that kind of principle, think about it as to where you turn the very limited capacity we have in health economics on the problems. And so therefore, we should think about where do we have the greatest likely <laughs> sources of inefficiency that if we analyze them, could then be remedied, right? That's where we should think about focusing our health economics um, uh, energies. And so what I'd like to do is just to sort of say, well, what's kind of the whole life cycle of possibilities of where might you focus those health economics energies? And no reason not to start with, since we're in an academic medical center, with your guys' core business. And that first piece of that core business is medical education. So how are we at spending money to achieve human capacity in, in health, you know, human resources and health? How good are we at spending money to produce human resources and health? Well, I think unquestionably we're the worst in the world at that too. <laughs> I mean, to start with, we, we decided on a model where you send people to four years of college and then four years of medical school, but nobody else does that. So, there better be some pretty good studies that show that those extra two years of study produce better doctors. But I don't know of any studies that suggest that, right? And then, without wanting to pick on anybody in particular who's here, but, you know, maybe I will. Um, imagine if you're a plastic surgeon, okay? Part of your time is spent doing extraordinarily complex stuff, you know, taking people who've been terribly burned and reconstructing them and doing extraordinary things. And another big part of your time is spent cranking out nose jobs, blepharoplasties to remove all this stuff, um, and breast reconstructions, right? To create somebody who's able to do that full spectrum from, you know, recreate a whole person from shreds that come out of some horrible accident or fire or whatever to cranking out nose jobs, we put somebody through four years of college, four years of medical school, seven years of surgical training, right? And what would it take to take a smart kid out of high school and train them to do a nose job, right? It, it wouldn't take much. Promise, it wouldn't take much. We do almost that much for gastroenterologists, very sophisticated <laughs> folks who deal with some very complex problems. They spend a lot of their time every day doing colonoscopies, right? What would it take to train somebody to do colonoscopies? Would it take four years of college, four years of medical school, four years of, uh, three years of um, internal medicine plus a fellowship in gastroenterology? No, of course it wouldn't, right? So, and let me just, for those docs here for whom this is like extraordinarily threatening, let me ask you one, <laughs> let me ask you one question. Um, nurses too, doctors, nurses. How many doctors and nurses do we have, by the way? Oh good, lots of them. <laughs> Now, think back, whether you're a doctor or a nurse, to that 1st of July, okay? And by chance, you start, you're in the ICU. But this time, you're a patient in the ICU. All the new interns are now in the hospital, right? You're a patient in the ICU. Here's the question I have for you. All the senior residents and all the attendings have gone to the picnic. You have the intern and the ICU nurse there, and something happens to you. Somebody's got to write the orders. You have a choice. Does the ICU nurse write the orders, or does that brand new intern write the orders? Right? There's nobody, nobody who's been through medical school, nobody who's been through nursing school who would hesitate to answer that question. They would definitely get the nurse to write those orders. Right? But, why then is that intern the one that we want to continue that residency? Why is it that ICU nurse equally qualified, or in fact, better qualified, to start the same residency that I was starting in internal medicine that day, than that fresh out of med school med student. Um, do we have any objective evidence to suggest that that brand new medical student is a better candidate for an internal medicine residency than that ICU nurse? And the answer is no, right? We have no, no such evidence. 
In fact, what is the number one most important criteria that we use to judge who should be a doctor and who shouldn't? How well you scored on your organic chemistry exam in the middle of that drunken first year of college, <laughs> right? That's the number one criteria. And what do we know about how well that predicts how good a doctor you're going to be? Oh, we know. It doesn't predict it at all, right? So just starting at the beginning of this process, health economists have a lot to offer <laughs> in terms of thinking about the efficiency of medical education, right? So what's the other business that we're engaged in in an academic medical center? And that's research. Right? So we have to ask the same question. How good are we at translating the money that we spend on research into health benefit? Now, an economist would come in and look at that and say, well, like, let's at least come up with some hypotheses about it. Let's see, are the incentives for all those academic researchers aligned to encourage them to work on the things that they should work on to maximize the probability that it will affect the health of the public? And the answer is no. No, the academic incentives take that into account very little. It's true, it's probably easier to get a Nobel Prize if you cure HIV than if you cure, cure myasthenia gravis. But that's, you know, a very distant incentive. Mm -hmm. What matters is the impact of your publications in the right journals, right? And that turns out to be poorly correlated with the likelihood that this thing that you're publishing is going to have impact. In fact, on the contrary, it encourage you, encourages you to slice and dice your, your, um, the knowledge that you produce into as many publications as possible, which takes time away from actually disseminating them and getting them out and getting people to use them. And that interferes with the ability to turn something into, into useful knowledge. In addition to that, for reasons that are still kind of obscure to me, because I work you know, sometimes in the economics world and sometimes in the health world. In the economics world, you have to trot out a paper that you've finished you know, 30, 40, 50 times, job talks all over the country. Once your peers believe that it's important, then it can be published. Right? And in the medical world, we keep everything absolutely private and secret until the last possible minute so that the Lancet or the New England Journal can get a bigger splash in its, <laughs> in its publication, right? Is that aligned with the idea that we would as quickly as possible disseminate new knowledge, get other people to use it so that we achieve health impact as quickly as possible? No, no. And frankly, we to a large degree do it to ourselves. Um, the other question related to that is that we have IRB issues which we have self-imposed, where we don't consider the costs of those either. I find it extraordinarily, you know, bizarre that the journalist that called me yesterday um, can do all kinds of things without talking to an IRB. <laughs> he, can, he can lie to me, <laughs> trick me about what he's actually working on to get me to reveal things that I don't want to reveal so that he can publish them in the newspaper. <laughs> right? And that's okay. Right? Um, when my wife was doing a trial in Mexico, Jaime will remember this, looking at the impact of a school education curriculum on what it did to pregnancy and knowledge about safe sex and other kinds of things, she was asked by the IRB to get parental informed consent. And we finally won that argument because I said, well, the school system doesn't need parental informed consent to implement the curriculum. And yet we want parental informed consent to find out whether, to be able to examine whether the students learned anything from the curriculum or not, right? So I think that that's another area in which we have to think about what is the, the efficiency of our system and where are we getting return on our investment in health. Um, let me switch now from, that was education, that was research, remember I'm trying to stay high. Um, to the whole issue of the delivery of health services. Now, that's obviously where most of the health economics focus is, and I'm going to come back to it because I want to touch I want to mention two other areas which are ripe for attention from health economists and then come back to this issue of our health services. Another one is the question of how the rest of things in society, everything what is it, 18% GDP on health in this country now? that leaves 82% that does other things. Government services, private sector, economic activity, everything else. Those things turn out not to be independent of health. 
right? So whether we're talking about fracking to get natural gas out of Nebraska, or global warming, or public transport, and bicycle friendly lanes, or even how we approach policing and security, all of those things are very closely related to health. And so it's useful to think about when can we do those things in a way that is more virtuous in terms of its impact on health and less destructive in terms of its impact on increasing disease, right? So that's an important area of inquiry for health economists. And then the last one I'd mentioned before coming back to health services is the area of the financing of health services. And that's a difficult one to wall off. So let me just say one aspect about it. If you get breast cancer, that's bad. Okay? Somehow the fates cut the string in your place, you got the breast cancer. Well, it's a real bummer if in addition to getting breast cancer, you also have to become impoverished. Right? That's like double whammy. Now, it turns out that it's really hard for us to screen somebody from getting breast cancer. Right? We're getting better at treating it, we're not getting much better at stopping the thing from happening spontaneously in the first place. But we have really good mechanisms for avoiding having to become impoverished as a result of your breast cancer, right? So that's what, why the world created insurance mechanisms. And the way we finance health, and this is very important in this country right now, um, for obvious reasons, it's very important in the entire developing world. Most other countries anywhere close to as rich as we are figured it out a long time ago and, uh, and do a much better job than we do. But that issue of separating impoverishment from health problems from the health problems themselves is an obvious area where economics has something to say about um, uh, the structure of the financing of the health system. The reason I said though that it's complicated is that it turns out also not to be independent of the economics of the delivery of health services. And that's because the way things are financed changes the behavior both of the recipients of health services and of the providers of health services in ways that are very interesting and very much related to the economics of those health services. And I think, you know, if you're wearing my glasses, um, I get a new pair every year. Why do I get a new pair every year? Because my insurance company pays for a new pair every year. Although now that these progressive things have gotten so expensive, I've, I've now started getting a pair every two years. I buy the frame in December and the lenses in January and then wait <laughs> to do it again. But that's because I can't help but being a health economist. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it turns out that those kinds of things influence behavior, right? So when a health economist comes in and sees the UC health plan, it covers cleaning of your teeth, right? Now, there's never been anything that is less amenable to an insurance mechanism than cleaning of your teeth, because you're supposed to do it twice a year no matter what, right? It isn't some random event that's gonna give you breast cancer against which you'd wanna protect yourself. This is entirely predictable. So why would you pay an insurance company to manage your sending a check to the dentist for your teeth cleaning, right? From an efficiency perspective, it makes no sense whatsoever. But from a behavioral economics perspective, I may want to spend those $300 in advance so that I force myself to actually use that benefit that I've already paid for and get my teeth cleaned. If I actually had to pay $150 every time I needed to have my teeth cleaned, I'd probably get them cleaned much less often and maybe I want to trick myself into that. Of course, that's not the way people actually think about it because um, it turns out UC just mandates that it has to be in there. Maybe they know better, I don't know. Um, but that's just an example of how the financing system ends up mattering for the delivery side. Now, Jaime mentioned, that's why I asked him to look at this piece of paper, he mentioned that in precision medicine, we want to get the right drug to the right people at the right time. Right? And I'd suggest that, and I, what I was going to say, and then I'll make it this is similar to Jaime's, is that what we're about in health economics is getting the right services to the right people at the right price. And then in parentheses I'll add, at the right time. Because it turns out that's important too. Um, although that's what I kind of meant by to the right people, meaning to the right people at the right time in their lives. So this issue of the right services, the right people, the right price, well that actually captures many of the things that, that Jim had listed on, the, on his slide. Right? And why do we do cost effectiveness analysis? Well it's to figure out 
which of those services or interventions give you more or less value, right? Why do we do epidemiology? Well, it's largely to figure out who's at risk of a disease or who's got a disease and who needs the services. And then there's a lot on the efficiency of the delivery of them, getting it to them at the right price. And by the right price, I mean the value laden price. In other words, the, the price that buys you the services that have value. So that doesn't mean buying the cheapest service, it means buying the right one. So you want the right level of service. And one of the bizarre things coming back to this country after many years away is this concept that um, we all want the best health care that money can buy. Now, I want a float plane. <laughs> So what, right? Um, who says that I should have a float plane, right? Because I want the best transportation money can buy to go from here to, I don't know, whatever. Um, it was more relevant in, 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 I used to want a float plane a lot in Seattle, because there's lots of places to go. I want one a little bit less here. I just want a regular plane. <laughs> but the point is that of course we all want the best healthcare money can buy, but that's not relevant, right? It's, it's not relevant because we all can't have the best healthcare money, money can buy unless we have less of other things, and presumably there's some balance point where how much we want something. I wouldn't mind a Ferrari too, although it would be kind of embarrassing, right? But if you gave me a Ferrari, I would sell it to buy other things that I want more with that money, right? A house would, wouldn't be bad right now. <laughs> um, so that's a major focus of what we could and should do with our health economics expertise, and we're going to spend more time this afternoon doing that. So now I'm just going to finish up by zoom down into my current obsession. And I had three current obsessions, but time is short, so I'm only going to talk about one current obsession. And it's a, it's a current obsession that's really current, because I spent, as I told a couple of you, the last two nights in London, but actually here, so I was on a video conference from you know, midnight to 9 a.m. And it uh, turns out to be much more efficient than, than going to London. And when they say, oh, I can't believe you're staying up all night, my answer was, well, I would have stayed up all night anyway, just over there. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I, why I did this, because I'm on the equivalent of a study section for the Wellcome Trust that is looking at trials in developing countries. And, Many of those trials were actually related to the delivery of health services rather than to the evaluation of some new drug or technology or whatever. And I was amazed. Um, I, I really was amazed because in every single case, those delivery-related trials took the tools that had been developed to test whether one drug works or not and applied those tools to something that is of complex system of service delivery in what I would call a completely inappropriate way. It was just nuts to see what people were coming forward in terms of designs. So that's my current obsession. It's very current because I've just been obsessing about it for two days. Um, the, the interesting thing about it is um, it gets back to the thing I said at the very beginning about what are the incentives in our academic enterprise. And one of the important incentives in our academic enterprise is that you get kudos as a scientist if you have a hypothesis, which is based on some elegant theory, you test that hypothesis and you're right. Because <laughs> if those things happen, you have a theory and an elegant hypothesis and you test it and you're right, you can get a Nobel Prize, even if it doesn't make any difference. Now, it's easier to get a Nobel Prize if it makes a difference. But the elegance of that knowledge is really important. Now, if you screen 100,000 molecules for their activity against falciparum malaria, and you find one that's incredibly effective, you're not going to get a Nobel Prize. Sorry. You may save millions of lives, but you won't get a Nobel Prize, because that didn't come out of an elegant, hypothesis-driven scientific research process. Right? So, um, what does that mean in terms of health services? Well, it's especially bad. Because the good thing is that in the biological sciences, we end up in that phase three trial of a drug 
after a lot of winnowing down, right? We start off in petri dishes. We see, in the case of an antibiotic, we see how uh, bugs um, react to this compound in the petri dish. In fact, we probably do that even earlier. We look at the enzyme that we think we're affecting. We can take lots and lots of compounds. We can screen them down, and then we can start putting them to animals, and we can screen them down some more, and then we can put them into a few people. And by the time we get to a phase three trial, we've actually considered a whole number of possibilities and reduced them down to the ones that we think have the greatest likelihood of success. What do we do in health services? Well, we have some brilliant person who says, I think that the way to achieve adherence with antiretroviral therapy is to do the following six things. And even better if they're based in some theory of reasoned action or something about you know, why people do what they do, right? And then I will take that thing and I will get somebody to give me $15 million and I will test whether that works better than what other people normally do, right? Now, when Jim asked me this morning what I was going to talk about, he says, are you going to talk about um, lattes again? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so a couple of you maybe were here when I was in the same place a little while ago. But imagine if Starbucks used the approach that I just described, right? What they would do is to say, folks, what do we think is going to be the next best seller? And there would be some murmurings. And one guy would say, pumpkin spice chai latte, <laughs> right? And the CEO would say, that's it, right? We're going to spend $20 million, put it into, you know, a, however many gazillions of stores that they've got and hope it wins. Um, and we're going to make sure that we measure it so that we have statistically significant results, right? <laughs> now, they would go out of business very quickly. Because the likelihood that that guy who said pumpkin spice chai latte was the winner is really low, right? Especially because it sounds crazy, right? <laughs> Turns out it worked, right? But I can guarantee you it wasn't the only one they, they tested, right? What they did was they got lots and lots of crazy ideas and they tested them on 10 people or five people. And the ones that looked pretty good with 10 people, then they went to 100 people. They looked at lots and lots of things and finally, when it came out that pumpkin spice chai latte looked pretty good, they rolled it out. And you know what? When they rolled it out, they also measured how much it sold in each of the Starbucks's, right? And they do that continuously and iteratively all the time, and that's how they make gazillions of dollars, right? So why on earth would we test somebody's one brilliant idea and spend 10, 15, 20 million dollars to test it, rather than doing things like they do? And one of the reasons for that is that somebody taught us in somewhere in our education that if we couldn't make a decision with 95% certainty, it wasn't worth asking, right? That's pretty stupid because what we end up doing is answering 1% of the questions that people in the real world have with 95% certainty and having nothing to say about the 99% of the questions that we haven't done the RCT on, right? So does that mean that we can't apply rigor to answering some of these questions? No, it doesn't. It just means that we have to apply a different model. It's not the model that was developed to test a drug that we want to apply. And fortunately, like always, economists are the answer. <laughs> because it turned out that the study of economics usually spends its time looking at the very, very messy real world and trying to make sense out of it. And that means looking at systems of how many different variables interact, right? Those are, that's the kind of thinking we need to apply in the delivery space. And what we need to do is set up the experiments that we do so that we maximize the probability that we're going to find that pumpkin spice chai latte. And unfortunately, what that means is that oftentimes we've got to be willing to do empirical work rather than hypothesis-driven work. And we've got to change the incentives so that's not a bad thing, right? And what does that mean in terms of adherence? It means that we probably don't, I'm just saying adherence to HIV, to antiretrovirals, just as an example. Rather than sitting here and thinking, getting really smart people at UCSF to say, this is what I think is the answer. Well, it turns out we have thousands and thousands of clinics out there doing this every day. And it turns out they're not all the same, right? We have a huge distribution out there. We have negative deviants and positive deviants. We have clinics where the viral suppression rates are 30% and clinics where the viral suppression rates are 95%. So, what you would do if you were in Starbucks 
would be to figure out what's going so well in those Starbuckses that are making money hand over fist and what's going poorly in the ones that aren't. That's not the way we approach this, and that's crazy. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs>